Hi everyone, I'm Luke Ciprietti, PGY4 in Internal Medicine, and my screencast is entitled CHF versus COPD versus Pneumonia versus Other, Utilizing Point-of-Care Lung Ultrasound Consultation for a Common Conundrum. Before getting started, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Robert Arnfield, Critical Care Physician and Director of the Canadian Resuscitative Ultrasound Course, uh, for guidance and feedback on the image acquisition used for this presentation. Now training as an internist, I wanted this screencast to demonstrate the utility that POCUS can provide beyond the ICU or emergency department in hopes of increasing interest and utilization among core medicine trainees. So this presentation we use a real life case-based example of a POCUS consultation that I did during my rotation on a general medicine patient and how using this resource can help with what I call three quote-unquote decision points during a patient's illness. Coming up with your differential diagnosis for the presenting complaint, trying to decide on what the most appropriate imaging or testing might be, and finally coming up with your therapeutic plan. So this case involves a 77-year-old female who's been admitted to the medicine ward with a CHF exacerbation. Her history is one of progressive dyspnea on exertion, two courses of antibiotics for possible pneumonia, and also a treatment of Lasix in the urgent care center a few days prior to her admission. The relevant past medical history includes CHF with a reduced ejection fraction, mild COPD, and hypersensitivity dermatitis. The dermatitis plays an important role because her treatment involves chronic prednisone and methotrexate. She's also on the standard long-acting bronchodilator and a home diuretic. In the few days during her admission prior to the POCUS consultation, she had not really been improving with IV furosemide. She was becoming volume depleted and now had an acute kidney injury. So the medicine consultant asked us to see this patient in hopes of finding some other reason for her hypoxemia. Here's a look at her chest x-ray just prior to the consultation. You can still see some interstitial markings diffusely in both lung fields. And there's a left lower lobe opacity seen better on the lateral. When you're about to do a point of care lung ultrasound for hypoxemia, it's good to keep a differential diagnosis at the forefront. However, to focus your scanning and to help your mind hone in on features that you'd be looking for, you should keep the differential diagnosis in the context of the patient in front of you. So for this patient, we're wondering about possible infection, vascular causes like a pulmonary embolism, inflammatory lung disease, or toxicity from methotrexate, as well as CHF and COPD. This is a common clinical scenario on the general medicine ward where a patient may have features of each of these presentations, but not enough that you can hang your hat on one over the other. So how can the point of care lung ultrasound help in a patient like this? We know that in critically ill patients, the lung ultrasound can be more accurate than the chest x-ray in assessing for several lung pathologies. Now, while the majority of the literature is in the critical care setting, I found that applying these principles to patients on the general medicine ward still applies in helping you sort out the underlying disease process. So let's start with the lung ultrasound images of the left lung. Our first image is taken in the left anterior clavicular line. And you see that there's sliding of the pleural line, ruling out a pneumothorax at that point, and B lines throughout, emanating from the pleural line all the way to the bottom of the image. 
in interpreting this scanning point, we would say that there's a beeline pattern suggesting abnormal lung aeration, which could be an interstitial edema or early pneumonia. Going on to the left anterior axillary line, we see pretty much the same findings. So our interpretation at this lung scanning point on the left doesn't change. Taking a look at the costophrenic angle, we can decide if there's evidence of pleural effusion or consolidation or atelectasis causing the hypoxemia. We see the diaphragm come into view here with respiration and a small curtain sign, which is normal lung tissue swinging into the image during inspiration. More importantly, it's what we do not see. And we don't see a large anechoic space above the diaphragm with compressed or atelectatic lung. And we also do not see lung tissue that has become hepatized, suggesting consolidation or pneumonia. So in interpreting this image, we'd say there's curtain sign, no effusion, and no consolidation. Heading to the left plaps view, we get the same result with a slightly more obvious curtain sign. Again, our interpretation is curtain sign with no effusion or consolidation. Going on to the right lung, in the right anterior midclavicular line, we see something quite different than on the left. We still have a normal shimmering pleural line ruling out pneumothorax, but rather than B lines, we have A lines, which is indicative of a normal aeration pattern. Going to the right anterior axillary line, we see the same finding. A-line pattern suggesting normal lung aeration. Heading to the right costophrenic angle, we see pretty much the same finding as we did on the left. Here's the diaphragm, normal lungs swinging in with inspiration, also known as curtain sign, and an absence of a large anechoic space of, of pleural effusion and the absence of a consolidated hepatized lung. So here again, we have curtain sign without an effusion or consolidation. And finally, the right plaps view also shows curtain sign without an effusion or consolidation. I'd like to point out here, there is a large rib shadow obscuring the view of the diaphragm. When this happens, you need to take caution in interpreting your finding since viewing the entire diaphragm is important in effectively ruling out a pleural effusion. In this situation, it might be better to obtain a different image where the diaphragm is more visible. However, in this scenario, we still called it as a curtain sign with no effusion and no consolidation. So just like any other consult, we can formulate an impression and recommendation from our findings to the medical team. We said that there's a lack of diffuse beelines, which argues against pulmonary edema. But we can't ignore the fact that there are focal beelines in the left upper zone. These focal beelines could represent an early pneumonia or an underlying focal interstitial disease. At this point, it would be up to the medical team to take that information and see if anything in the patient's history, physical exam, or otherwise supports one of these diagnoses over the other. We also commented that there's no consolidation and no effusion and we summed it up by saying the clinical picture is more in keeping with pneumonia over pulmonary edema. And so from this interpretation, we can provide the following recommendation. We told the team to consider infection given that the patient is on immunosuppressive agents. We also suggested considering imaging for pulmonary embolus. PE 
should be thought of when a patient is hypoxemic with a completely normal lung ultrasound. Now, this patient's lung ultrasound was not completely normal with the left-sided B lines. However, there was enough normal lung findings to make us think that this should be investigated. And our final recommendation was to reduce or discontinue her IV LASIK. Thankfully, the team took our advice to heart and got a CT scan with PE protocol. There was no evidence of a pulmonary embolism, but there was evidence of new diffuse bronchiolitis. And the reporting radiologist felt that this was consistent with an infectious cause. So how did our point of care lung ultrasound help resolve the case? The team decided to discontinue her furosemide. She became euvolemic and her AKI improved. And rather than continuing diuresis, they chose to go with antibiotics and a five-day course of an increased dose of prednisone up to 50 milligrams. With this, she was able to be weaned off her oxygen. And ultimately, she was discharged home. I hope that using this case, I've convinced you that point-of-care lung ultrasound can be a helpful tool at the bedside. The findings from a study like this can make you rethink your initial diagnosis and change your plan. I also hope that this presentation has encouraged you to use the POCUS service for your ward patients and the residents on the service are eager to get scanned or even better, to get interested and learn yourself how to do point of care lung ultrasound. Thanks for watching my presentation and I hope you learned something about point of care lung ultrasound in a general medicine patient.